I think we are, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I, I echo your, your feelings about this conference. It's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing to hear everybody, and it's amazing to uh, see the conference done in this way. Um, today, I'm going to uh, take you through a presentation which I've called The Tragedy of the Commons People, a Marma Overview. So this, this uh, presentation came to me as a scheme of thinking, which came about whilst investigating Mary Burns and how intersecting signifiers result in poverty and exclusion but how poverty itself becomes a proxy signifier. The introduction of the, the idea um, I've found gives depth to the concept of intersectionality. So the, the key premise is the tragedy of the commons is that the people are the commons and are exploited and dehumanized, shortening their lives and damaging their health. Uh, the people, for all their richness, are dominantly represented by silence in the accounts of history. So the story of Mary and Fred, uh, silence in the story of history, illustrating the intersecting tragedy. So uh, Mary Burns was the lifelong partner of uh, Friedrich Engels. And uh, Friedrich Engels is most commonly known for uh, working on the Communist Manifesto with Karl Marx. These two guys uh, are, are very known in history. Uh, but what I, I, I discovered was that uh, there's no account of Mary Burns. Almost all of her, uh, all, all of her correspondence, uh, any trace of her is is missing. It's it's been erased, and that that got me interested. It's it's uh, an absence, a conspicuous absence, and so I started to try and build in uh, what uh, questions of what what can we know. So Mary Burns is known for introducing Engels uh, to the, the, the ways that people were living who were working in the factories. Uh, Friedrich Engels, uh, his, his family owned the factories that she worked in and uh, he fell in love with her and vice versa, it seems. But uh, I, I was surprised that uh, we, we can find a photograph of her sister and uh, accounts of what she said, but not Mary. And so I, I started to piece together the historical context. So she was a part of the Irish diaspora, uh, which faced racism. And uh, so you've got populations leaving Ireland after long um, persecution, uh, so much so that uh, the, the Irish people were, it, it was made illegal to educate each other. So they formed uh, schools called hedge schools. And there are accounts of uh, these hedge schools producing highly learned people. You know, they spoke Irish uh, and studied Brehan, but they, they also knew ancient Greek and ancient Latin and typically left Ireland to go and live and work on the continent. You can still, uh, well, it's evident in the, the historical humour, Irish people were often the, the the butt of uh, humour 
depicting them as edu uneducated and stupid. She was also a woman. And during that time, she faced the dehumanization of sexism, where women just didn't figure in the cultural scheme. Um, it wasn't that long earlier that Mary Wollstonecraft was uh, writing um, uh, Vindication of the Rights of Man and the Vindication of the Rights of Woman, which really caused significant disturb cultural disturbances. So um, the third, third intersecting reality was that she was poor and worked in the mills and had uh, little, no choice but to perform the work that was asked of her in the mills for basic sufficiency. So in this, in this presentation, I'm going to use the term class as a topology of finance and status as distinct or different to a cultural signifier. So the, the word class can be understood as category. Uh, if you're standing in front of a beach, you might see a category of people in the, in the water. And if you're uh, looking at the, the sand, you might see a, a, a class or category of people on the sand. This is how I'm using it. The factors intersect and coalesce to inform where an individual resides in a hierarchy of finance and status determining the choices of people that people have in their lives. Groups are excluded and displaced from the so socioeconomic institutions of society. As a result, their voices are uh, denied. They're, they're not heard. Um, they, they, they become overshadowed by a, a, a silence. So I'm, I'm going to draw a long backdrop to this, uh, and, and it's to, to describe precarity. The displacement of collectives uh, uh, from the sufficiency of the commons. So we can go back to 1290 in the UK, where statutes were introduced to prevent land ownership becoming distributed. At that time, you had things like um, keyhole tenure, where if you could raise a roof over your head and uh, stoke a fire by morning, you were allowed to stay on common land. So there were ancestral rights to draw sufficiency, to, to live your life from the land. A few centuries later, you see the, the narrowing the, of ownership of the land. These statutes had prevented uh, the, the, uh, the distribution of ownership. And in the 1600s, you started to see enclosures movements. Uh, populations were being displaced from the rights to common land and sufficiency, and they were moved to urban centers to form exploitable, precarious workforces. Uh, famous examples are the Highland and Lowland clearances. Uh, an another famous example is Gerard Wynne Stanley and the diggers who were making utopian communities and uh, plowing the ground and drawing the food they needed to exist. We move forward again to 1906 and Wilfredo Brito in Italy, uh, does an assay of land ownership in Italy. And he shows that uh, it's highly concentrated with about 80% of the land owned by 20% of the population. Coming forward to today, we've got uh, statistics like 0.0049% of the, the population owns 34% of the whole of the country of Scotland. And in 2019, half of uh, England is owned by less than 1% of its population. So that, that made me think about how the landscapes changed and people 
came to be living in these urban centres and could no longer grow food, so had to perform to get that food and uh, self-sufficiency. I'm looking at, uh, uh, at the, the different categories, the classes, in terms of uh, permissions and allowances. There's a class of people who live with the necessity of performing to the desires of a sanctioned hierarchy, which offers permission and validation within the hierarchy to access the prerequisites for subsistence, food and heat and the like. The resources you have determine what allowances you have and whether you have choice in performing for others. Choice is an interesting word uh, discussed by Martha Newsbaum and Amartya Sen in their work. Um, so distinguishing working class from leisure class. I looked at the, the origin of the word leisure comes from Middle English, from the Old French, leisure, based on the Latin lyciri, uh, to be allowed. Um, so here's, here's a scheme of uh, how I'm seeing things currently. On the left hand side, we've got the working class and moving towards the right, we've got the leisure class. On the left, we've got performers, people who have to perform for sufficiency, they're the workers of the mills. And moving to the right, we've got allocators of sufficiency. They, they are allowed, they have allowances, they've got resources, they're the owners of the mills. These are the people to whom the, the profits of the labour accrue. The further right in the picture, the increasing numbers of choices available and the decreasing numbers of people you must perform to. Non-representation and culturally codified devaluation. Uh, working or performative classes are those qualified by appeal to somebody in the cultural hierarchy who has allowances. Example of, examples of this uh, as how they're codified into our, our legal system today you can find the countersigning of passport photos must be by a person of good standing in the community or work in or be retired from a recognized profession. So I ask, uh, I ask in that context, uh, you know, somebody without any formal qualifications, uh, you know, they have to seek permission. They have to be validated, their very identity must be validated. Um, but also uh, women have been required to seek permissions and allowances from men by law. I've been having a discussion with Annie Miller, one of the principal architects of the universal basic income. And she was telling me how the, the rationale for formulating her economic views was because she had to go through her husband for everything. She had to get permissions uh, in law from uh, male people in her life, rather than being valued in and of herself. And of course, we've got the creation of hostile environments. Um, people of colour have been exploited and devalued in numerous ways, which, uh, you know, in the, the Windrush scandal, uh, um, countless people were denied their very identity um, and it was frank racism codified into the bureaucracies of the United Kingdom's law and civil service. So how I'm making sense of this is that it's the derivatization of individuals and the dehumanization of outgroups. Dr. Derek Bell in the, race, in the field of critical race theory argued significant change may only come about when there is a convergence in the interests of the dominant culture with those of the individuals seeking parity. Anne Cahill 
a feminist philosopher. Um, she, she identifies derivatization as a form of dehumanization, where an individual is treated as human only when they perform to the agenda and the desires of the enfranchised. The creation of performative underclasses to sanctioned hierarchies um, is, is a result of these structures, these hard-coded uh, realities that people have to live under, up and through. The lower down in the socioeconomic status, the more people you have to perform to in order to achieve sufficiency. Groups excluded and displaced from the socioeconomic institutions of society, which have their voices ignored, are visible through the impoverishments they live with and through. Um, so we might think of people who uh, are without a home and can't get a bank account. And because they can't get a bank account, uh, other institutions in society don't recognize them. They they can't get into a home because they've not got a bank account and so on and so forth. But the, the poverty is very visible. Intersecting impoverishments and competing for distinction. As a result, we've got a society that uh, sets up dynamics where individuals have to compete for scarce resources to be allocated to them. A uh, historical example is uh, between 70. 1750 and 1790, Scottish wages remained below those of England. English tycoons like Richard Arkwright boasted that the lower costs of production in Scotland would enable him to take a, 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 to take a razor to the throat of Lancashire, highly skilled part of the country uh, and a highly enlightened one. So Living these lives uh, creates constant stress. Um, and the, the work of Marco, Michael Marmot, uh, I think, has, has ex um, extreme importance because there are multiple large scale longitudinal studies that started uh, as, as the Whitehall studies uh, and looked at how people were living. Uh, and the, the health costs of being um, in different places in the socioeconomic scale. The overwhelming and agreed upon uh, uh, observations were that the lower down in the socioeconomic scale you are, the shorter the lifespan and the greater number of health problems. A large body of research demonstrates that stress is a key component of shortened lifespan and ill health, both mental and physical. So the people as the commons and the inequity in the hierarchy as the tragedy. Um, it's the, the, the difference between the people, at, uh, the, the opportunities at the top and the bottom, which um, Wilson, uh, Wilkinson Pickett uh, in their work, The Spirit Level, and uh, their subsequent book examined. The tragedy of the commons people is that they're exploited by those who have enclosed the sufficiency of the commons, shortening lives and damaging health. So key in all of this is the artificial creation of scarcity. It's not that things are scarce, it's that scarcity has been produced for specific categories of people. Um, and uh, this is not just in the United Kingdom, but it's worldwide. If you look at Professor Jean Seigler in his book, Betting on Famine, he examines how the world produces uh, food for 12 billion people uh, and there's about 7 billion people, but 1 billion are kept in constant famine. Thank you for listening. I look forward to any thoughts and comments.
Thank you very much for that, Alex. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you, Alex. Oh, there is a question. Alex, what do you think of Garrett Hardin's argument about the tragedy of the commons? So I don't know if you want to answer that, Alex, now. Well, that's that's what I'm working towards in the, uh, the paper. If I'm right, um, the idea uh, the, the, the authors you're quoting are that if the uh, somebody doesn't uh, look after the commons, take control of the commons, they're despoiled and devalued. Uh, my response to that is, well, we, we can view it in multiple ways. One, that the people are a part of the commons, that we're making a false distinction between ourselves and the land, and that we're seeing uh, the effects of the environmental destruction, uh, both out there in nature, but also in our sociological habitat as Homo sapiens. But I think uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work on the commons shows that um, to have uh, vertical hierarchies controlling and dictating what happens in the commons uh, is uh, it is not necessary. Um, so I think that Eleanor Ostrom's work is very important reading here.